You're listening to Patch Bay on TYM KRS. Welcome to Patch Bay, show where we like to uh, talk about audio engineering, recording, stuff like that. Uh, Shane and I, we both do this all the time, all week long. And then uh, Monday rolls around and our break's finally done. And what do we do? We record a podcast and we share it with all of you. And we, yeah, exactly. And we discuss audio <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> this doesn't really feel like work, though, I must say. No, it doesn't. Not at all. <clears throat> well, it, it, it does help that I'm drinking wine currently while doing said podcast. But not that that hasn't happened in the studio before. But mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh Hmm. So last week we were discussing, we were getting really geeky last week, we were talking about um, transistors and uh, capacitors and all that kind of stuff, if I remember correctly. Yeah, a bit of uh, uh, interference and whatnot, I think, yeah. But, uh, interference? Yeah, like um, all sorts of uh, technical details involving uh, how to uh, avoid interference. Right, that's what the that's what the conversation was about. That's right. Yeah, that was a good one actually. Um, the one thing that had come to my brain, uh, since you have a variety of synthesizers at your house, um, I was going to ask, how do you normally record said synthesizers since they're all analog, aren't they? Oh goodness. Um, <laughs> really depends on what I'm doing, I guess. Um, and what which instrument, right? Uh, like yeah. anything else, you kind of have to approach it from, uh, you know, uh, what do you have around for recording and what are your options and what what's going to work well with each thing. Because, you know, synthesizers have been around a lot longer than people think they have. Mm. Um, that's one important thing to note. Um, a Hammond organ, you know, minor from the 50s, but they go all the way back to the 30s. Mm. And those are synthesizers. I, they may use exactly. electromechanical yeah. methods to synthesize, but they definitely synthesize waveforms. So, yeah. you know, in the 30s... <laughs> they were making synthesizers. And they were recording them, too. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it uh, depends on what you want it to sound like, I guess. Which one were you thinking? Oh, uh, well, no, because, like, obviously, there's some of, some of the synthesizers you have just have speakers on them right yeah 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 do they have have you wired outs for them or like because i know i have i can't remember what kind of organ it is i have at work but i have a it's just sitting there that we we got and um it doesn't have any outs whatsoever so anytime i ever do need to use it for something it's it's really cool too because it's like eight bit like uh, mario kind of sounding organ which awesome is really yeah yeah i'll take a picture of it and send let's it see to you. um I can't remember what it is on the but uh I, I, before on the old organs i've done a couple of things um i have a leslie cabinet um Hmm. that's the thing with the spinning speaker uh and that makes awesome doppler and if you put mics out in the room and stereo like that you can you can pick up the doppler effect uh really of the uh the spinning uh speaker cones in there uh that's a really fun one and that's been used on like every rock and roll song ever so you know it's a pretty standard yeah. thing to do uh i was just rereading here there and everywhere the book that jeff amrick wrote about recording the beatles and his first session he ran john's voice through uh leslie uh for i believe tomorrow tomorrow never knows i think was the song yeah you can use them for all sorts of things besides organs but man oh man do they sound good with a hammond um yeah so there's that, and uh, another way I can do the Hammonds is to actually, um, uh, Mike, I have uh, console organs, so they actually have a, a field coil speaker built into them. They're old enough that they have the real field coil speakers rather than a permanent magnet speaker. If you don't know what field coil it is, um, that's um, instead of having a magnet on the back of the speaker, it actually has uh, a big electromagnet. And uh, they're pretty awesome speakers. Uh, if you're a guitarist, um, you could probably make a very, very excellent sounding um, amp cabinet thing uh, with a field coil speaker and get uh, a clarity that you would never be able to achieve with a permanent magnet speaker. But 
If I catch you taking them out of functional organs, I will personally beat you with a stick. Because <laughs> um, they're very valuable and they haven't made any since the 50s and they're never going to make oh. any more. So they are absolutely a treasure and do not gut organs to get them. It's not, not okay. Yeah. The yeah. speakers will still be okay long after that organ is dead. Just wait. Sit there yeah. and wait. Right. Yes. That's funny. Damn guitar players, eh? Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard of a field coil before. That's interesting. Actually. Well, it's very old technology, and it's very good technology. There's a reason why they didn't make them anymore, and it's not because they weren't good. It's because they cost an arm and a leg to manufacture. That oh, back really? electromagnet has, you know, miles of copper wire wound around it. Right. So, right, you know, they, they just there's no way that we could afford to buy them nowadays. Uh, the third way that I record those is... um. The uh, the gas pedal on those organs, the the expression pedal, makes it louder, is actually right. a big air variable capacitor. Uh, when you push that pedal down, you're actually swinging fins in and out of a big um, air variable cap uh, through rotary motion. And the output of that goes into the amplifier. Uh, in the uh, This is between the preamp stage and the amplifier stage. So if you tap into the output of that air variable cap and add a DC blocking capacitor and tie it to, say, the tip on an instrument cable and you tie the shield of your instrument cable to the ground circuit of the organ. Now, mind you, you should do this carefully because there's high voltages present. But um, Way to blow up an amplifier. Well, way to <laughs> shock yourself bad, too. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah. really shouldn't work on these organs unless you know what you're doing. But um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, but uh, that's interesting. You though. can tap right in there like it's a line out. Um, you, you should be a little bit careful with your selection of capacitor, and you should check it, make sure that you're not swinging too high. Uh, you don't want to like hook this up to a very expensive console or something like that, and and blow out something. But um, if you know what you're doing uh, and you know how to test these things, you can get a nice clean line out right out of the expression pedal before it even goes through the final amplification stage of the uh the organ but the final amplification stage sounds really nice on those so you may not want to skip it yeah okay well that's, that's neat actually so you have ran you have ran some of pure synth through amps as well when you're recording yeah yeah i like to yeah. you take like the Wurlitzer electric piano um which is sort of uh, another electromechanical device uh you, it when you push the key a hammer hits a little metal tine and the tine vibrates under a big pickup uh it's essentially cool. works the same as a guitar pickup it's just really long and uh the the output of that is kind of like the output of a guitar it has a preamp and it goes to an amplifier and you can tap into that before the amplifier and plug it into a various uh, guitar amps if you wanted to add reverb or tremolo or anything like that mm. you could well that's cool it's really cool so i don't yeah, know i, I like have... hacking into those old things and giving the ability to add guitar pedal effects and that sort of thing and with the yeah. more modern synths yeah i mean i build them from scratch so obviously i usually build in some sort of a line out yeah, yeah, exactly. And it, actually, a question for that, too. I, I know you're building the module part of it. Um, so what do you do for the controller? Are you are you hooking it up MIDI to a controller, or what do you, how do you... What? Yeah, you could do a MIDI controller. I mean, that's that's fairly... I mean, for um, the, the actual brand new synths that I cook up from scratch... Um, a lot of them are controlled by programs running on microcontrollers. Some of them are controlled by um, some sort of physical controller like uh, an XY joystick or a set of buttons or, um, oh, cool. you know, I can do whatever. Uh, MIDI is just a protocol for allowing things to talk to each other. So you can use MIDI to allow a standard MIDI keyboard to be used to control these synthesizers you could use MIDI to allow a computer like a DAW to control these synthesizers, um, which is really cool. Um, but it's yeah. also limited in a certain way. Uh, MIDI is, it, it puts you into sort of um, a box. 
It's mm-hmm. like uh, playing a guitar where you can't bend the notes. You know, it's mm-hmm. being able to have a little bit more control over the the way in which a electrical circuit behaves doesn't always follow the exact rules of how the assumptions of yeah. how musical notes should behave in relation to one another. They, they're not always the same language. Right. So it's nice to be able to get away from MIDI if I want to and control these things in a more uh, literal fashion in their own language. Uh, Cause then I can so be more expressive musically. So what you're doing is you're writing like program data that tells the synth like MIDI, but you're writing it. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to wrap my head around how you. Yeah, this it. is really technical stuff and I'm, I'm happy to, <laughs> I'm happy to I'm... talk about it. It's just, um, um, finding a lay way to do it is sometimes a little bit challenging because it is so, you know, deep, um, of a level. Um, are you familiar with tracker programs from back in the day? Uh, well, I tracker. I, like, I uh, okay. So gimmick. these days when you have a DAW and you want to like program, say a drum pattern into your DAW, you're mm-hmm. basically dropping the notes on a grid. Okay, back oh, in the early that. days of computers, a tracker, you'd be using um, basically hexadecimal values in a grid, and the tracker just reads through this grid, and it controls all of the different aspects of the uh, synthesizer um, for the game, like, uh, say, Mario Brothers, whatever, would have had a tracker built into it, and it's just reading through all of these numbers, and it's changing which note it's playing, how long the note stays on, all that sort of thing, just through this big table of numbers. I essentially can build a tracker into any of these synthesizers, like on board, because they have so much extra processing power these days. Um, just with a microcontroller, I've got extra horsepower there. So that it can have its own simple um, controller, you know, basically a computer playing it for me if I want to um, right there inside of the synthesizer. You know, uh, now that you're talking about it, I, I have seen a tracker program, like a, actually a DOS based tracker program, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, the modern the day DOS was... sort of grew out of those. So, you know, it's yeah. a lot of us uh, music and producer type people have seen them. It's just been a while. Yeah, exactly. Now that we're talking about it, I do, I'm sort of, it's ringing a bell now. That's interesting, actually. I was going to mention, too, the um, the idea about using buttons or uh, like an XY controller. That It's almost uh, like pushing this, not theremin per se, but that kind of, um, it's interesting. It's yeah, interesting. I mean, totally. There's, there's no rule that says you have to control these things with a... Um with a, a piano keyboard, right? I mean, yeah, uh, exactly. the Moog synthesizer, you know, the one that started most of this, uh, didn't start out with a uh, uh, voltage um, controller uh, style keyboard on it. It was just, oh. you know, you create this voltage level and you give it to the synthesizer and it generates frequencies based off of that with its VCOs. And yeah. It wasn't until musicians showed up to play with the thing that they came up with the idea of, well, I, I'd sure like to be able to play an A, Bob. And Bob's yeah. like, well, I'm not, I don't do music. I, what do you need to play an A for? We're, we're free yeah. here. We can play anything. And the musicians are like, but it's really important that I can just play an A, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> If we ever do a commercial, we could use that exact line that you just said. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right, though. Yeah, it Because he was making them from the geeky standpoint of building a synthesizer, but not for any kind of yeah, practical yeah. application other than to be see if he could do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're, they're neat. So, you're yeah, you're talking about the big modular. Totally, uh, yeah. Modular synthesizer. So sexy. There's a picture somewhere on, do a Google search, but. There's a picture of Billy Corgan at a studio just lately from the Smashing Pumpkins, and he's there's a modular synthesizer behind him that's the size of, uh, you know, eight by ten foot wall behind them yep. that they ended up using on the latest record. I don't know what that one is. 
but I've seen it before and a few other pitchers too. I'm not sure if it's a Mooger or if it's something else. But. Yeah. Well, there's there's um there's a whole big huge scene um going on amongst guys who are in popular bands and are more in the producer role at this point. They a lot of those guys are starting to build very very extensive modular synthesis systems in their personal <laughs> studios. I can think of a few offhand. Um, uh, Dead Mouse, for example, uses it. Um, Trent Reznor has a very, very large um, collection of. It's a huge yeah. one, yeah. So you yeah. know that this is something that the the guys who really know what they're doing and are doing really well doing it, um, they are getting into this modular synthesis stuff really heavy in the last decade or so. So you know it's it's an important thing to know about if you're into producing and recording and engineering music you should really know what's up uh, when it yeah. comes to actual like modular synthesis it's kind of complicated to get into and build up a fundamental knowledge of but once you start rolling it's really not that complicated there's two things that sort of came into my mind while um while you were talking about that um one there used to be a program i'm not sure if it's still around but it was like mxpx or max MXP or something like that that would allow you to build build synthesizers, modular type synthesizers, but just as a stand it was a standalone program. Um, I'll have to I'll have to find it. It was actually kind of neat. You could you could build like every every single piece of the chain, which was kind of neat. And it was good too for building out ideas. Yeah. Um, and then the I I don't remember the name of the software I found. Do you know what I'm talking about? Not specifically, but I have definitely used similar software for various things. It's very cool stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the other thing I was going to mention too about um, oh, um, there's this one girl I follow on Twitter named Tara Bush. Okay. She's a big, she's a big synthesizer um, remix kind of person um and i can't remember her website off the top of my head but um I'll, I'll post it in the show notes anyway she's got really cool stuff though but she has a bunch of sort of youtube tutorials um where she's doing remixes and she'll she'll have tracks she's laying down and then she'll be filtering things through synthesizers or mooger fugers or um you know all those types of things and uh, anyway she's a you probably like her stuff, and she's just uh, like a huge sort of Moog fan. Like, I don't know how many pleasures she's got, but she's got lots. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I would check her out. Uh, so um, up in Canada up there, it, did, yeah. have they not gotten the memo that it's Moog? It's, uh, no, it's, we, we call it Moog up here. Huh, interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's another one, too. Um, you say reverb the way I say reverb, right? Reverb, yeah. Yeah, I know there there are guys. Uh, my friend, um, uh, Big Toe Studio, uh, Alan Wagner, he used to do a podcast, and he always he said reverb completely different. It was um, damn it, I can't even remember how he said it, but it was I was always like, what? I don't know, it's reverb, but yeah, it's it's just one of those things, I guess. Well, you say latency, latency, right? Yeah, I I could say it either way depending on who I'm talking to, but yeah, I I know who I'm talking to, so I try to keep things <laughs> yeah. northern, you know, <laughs> as much as possible. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. suicide dot com. So she's uh running things through outboard equipment, but she's doing it more of like thinking of it as modular synthesis way of approaching the problem, which I totally approve of. Yeah, she actually does. I, I'm just looking at a picture here online. Uh, and she's standing behind a, a huge wall of modular synthesizers. So uh, yeah. she's definitely a. But yeah, she she's sort of a, a, a keyboardist type musician plus remixer kind of stuff. I, I quite like her stuff. Uh, some of the remixes she's done and uh, and her own stuff too. But anyway, that's slightly off topic. But check her out. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Um... I can control it any way I want, and you could go as crazy as doing a theremin approach where it's very um, organic and analog in your inputs by using things like, well, 
You got to remember, uh, listeners, this is one of the shows that we do and many of the other shows that we do on this network involve uh, me having to learn how to use things like IR detectors or GPS sensors or <laughs> any of these things. And because I can use them at a hardware level, I can use them to control music. Uh, we yeah. were recording a podcast last night and uh, there's going to be this big um, high purse sized um, competition for developing some in the field medical equipment. And uh, my partner over here at the studio is a, a full time nurse and she works on electronics on the side. Uh, and uh, some of the sensors that are involved in the, the contest involve a, uh, an airflow sensor. And I'm sure a lot of you guys out there have seen uh, those uh, MIDI controllers that uh, run off of uh, wind, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that I could build like bagpipes or a uh, squeeze box uh, <laughs> out of her sensors that she gets in this package that they're sending over. So I could create a sort of music controller for my synthesizers that uh, uh, ran like uh, a wind controlled instrument. That's cool. Um, I, uh, I remember reading an article about guys who were using, well, MIDI at the time, but they were using, and they were doing stuff like that. They were using, well, there are wind controller MIDI um, instruments you can buy, but I, I remember reading this guy had, was using um, light and dance to create music. So he had um, sort of like light beams that, if you ran your finger across would trigger samples or notes or whatever. So, uh, and he created a whole show based around that technology sort of, it was kind of a neat idea. I'm guessing maybe using IR, I'm not really sure, but it was kind of neat anyway. Yeah. I mean, there's so absolutely no rules when it comes to this sort of thing. It's basically, yeah. if you think about it, like um, so many of the instruments that have become the standard, uh, instrumentation for our world um they they developed out of what makes sense mechanically in the real world and mm -hmm. then we had to sort of come up with this uh digital simulacrum of all of them uh some way to make them all playable uh from the same interface and the piano keyboard was probably uh the best choice that we could have made but mm -hmm. we've brought our technology to the point where that's no longer true anymore mm -hmm. we can create uh, I, uh, our own interfaces for things that make more sense for those instruments and if you're interested in this topic i might suggest going and looking up a guy named moldover who uh does shows around i think he's out of la or something and uh he basically creates his own controllers using uh arcade buttons and hacked up midi keyboards and all that sort of thing to control programs like ableton uh, so he can play his samples live and loop them live and all that sort of thing. Uh, unlike a lot of the uh, more electronic uh, performers, he's not pushing play and sitting back and letting the machinery do the work. He's actually mm. mashing the buttons to trigger all of the events through his uh, that Ableton drives Live. Me nuts. We were having a conversation about this last week at band practice, and I was saying that there needs to be a clear definition between a DJ and like there's turntablists, but there needs to be a definition between your regular club DJ and a guy who's actually creating somewhat spontaneous music yeah. live, whether he's using some loops off of a record and adding stuff and maybe mixing in other real music but there's a definite difference between the two and, and that the moniker of DJ, I think is, it's just a bad, I don't know. I would rather them call themselves EMs or something like electronic musicians or it, because it, it, it to me, it's like, it'd be hard to, not so much hard to market, but I mean, if you're, you know, if somebody says, yeah, hey man, I'm a DJ. I'm like, okay, uh, you want to do my auntie's wedding? You know, it's like, well, no, this is not the right guy to be, you know, kind of, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. And there's plenty of uh, good examples of why the line has become so blurry that it's impossible to even, I mean, you can look at 
some people and and be able to very very clearly say okay that person is a dj and that person is a musician a tape yeah. a taint uh turntablist is a musician it's not a dj yeah. because what yeah, they're doing right. there is like a physical thing creating a sound right then and there and it's different every time a dj is playing um something that has been previously produced in its entirety yeah. and maybe maybe if you're lucky uh cross mixing between tracks in a talented fashion um but uh or, or yeah. even so much as you know yeah taking the instrumental from one song and putting the vocals from another song on it but it's still not the same as some of the other more and that's not to say that but, djs yeah. don't don't do something very cool i think they do i think oh, I it's I, very I, I, neat i'm not i'm not ragging on them either i'm just saying that i think i feel like there should be a, a sort of a line in the sand <laughs> to yeah, it's very people. very difficult it's it's very difficult right now because a stop. lot of the best djs out there they they produce their own vinyl yeah. you know and then they're mixing off of stuff that they produced to create things live and that's when the line starts to get blurry and then you start getting into things like yeah we mentioned him earlier dead mouse he's he's uh a lot of his stuff is done through Ableton Live and it's triggered. Uh, but a lot of it's, you know, all those samples are created in advance. They may be being pulled up and triggered live and being, you know, brought together into the actual song in a live fashion. But only there's only so much of that that you can do live. And um, then you've got guys like Beardy Man over in the UK who is um, the, you know, world beatboxing champion for like the last 15 years or something mm -hmm. dude has four loopers that he runs and a bunch of effects boxes off of each of them and he literally just through beatboxing and creative use of looping is able to produce very very awesome music completely live creating the sounds from scratch while he's putting them into the looper which is absolutely mind-blowing so it, it is possible but in order for it to be possible, you have to set certain limitations for what you can put into your production, right? You can't sample a string section and bring it with you. You have to be able to create it right there in the fly, and that's difficult. Yeah, exactly. Or And or just, see, I mean, as long as it's been created by you at some point, rather than stealing, you know, a James Brown riff <laughs> or... You know, I mean, I sure, I'm sure those guys do tend to have, use those throwback things once in a while. But yeah, I mean, if it was whether it's created live at the time or it was created in the studio and is being played back live, um, it's still music. It was created by the. They're still a musician. <laughs> it's, you know, I mean, I, I I've seen country bands play live to a click track with, uh, you know, like a a doll running, and they've got you know steel guitar tracks and you know mandolins and fiddles playing in the background you're looking at the stage going there's four guys on the stage and they all have guitars or drums in their hands you know so <laughs> uh there's they, i mean that technology is happening even in stuff where you wouldn't even expect it you know what i mean yeah, like it's you're a not, lot easier for them to yeah. get away with it on those genres too because the uh the folks listening they don't really uh they don't think that the the technology coming out of the electronic music scene would have anything to do with their music but oh no no exactly. <laughs> they yeah, use it well, just as much you know and, and i think you know for most sort of people who are sitting in the audience they wouldn't even really catch it but it's like the people that you know who are in bands or, or do music or whatever like i don't see a steel player yeah i hear a steel player um i was gonna mention uh damn it, um I always see that in movies, too, okay, well, where they're doing, like, uh, you know, any movie that has to do with music or TV shows with musicians, and they start to sing, and then they're playing piano, and I'm like, okay, this is okay, but then, like, the drums start in the background, and the string section comes in, and I'm looking at the screen, I'm like, there's no drums, there's no strings, <laughs> you guys are annoying my, yeah. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of uh, that Just Friends movie, uh, that, uh, that one girl, I can't think of her name. She's so annoying, but uh, she's in the studio or whatever, and and she's uh, it, it's the thing they're they're multi-tracking everything, and and she's yelling at the producer that she can't get into the song because she can't play her her guitar, and 
the producer sort of a, a kind of a wing nut, and he's like, well, you know, we have to keep the tracks separated, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, well, but you're stealing my soul. It's like the song is about me and my guitar, but I'm not playing my guitar, so I'm totally... Anyway, it's, it's hilarious. Have you seen that movie with Ryan Reynolds? Uh, I don't, Friend? maybe. I've seen so many, Jane. Yeah, it's it's good. It, I, anytime there's any kind of recording thing on a on a movie, I'm like, ooh, I gotta watch this. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. yeah me that too. Case. Me too. And I'm usually <laughs> oh, disappointed at how they uh, uh, portray us. <laughs> but oh, every time, like, oh look, there's a nerdy guy picking his nose. He must be the engineer. Yeah, it it doesn't. Uh, but it's always the same, no matter what uh, profession uh, you're in. If uh, you see your role portrayed in, in a film or TV show, it's always <laughs> disappointing, to say the least, because it's except not the real cops. version. It's the it's the dramatic version. Yeah, I was going to say, except for cops, probably. That's probably the only the only profession where it's like, yeah, it's, it's never, ever the same. Or, well, I mean, sure, it could be, but you don't have the, you know, the, the boss reading you out and blah, blah, blah kind of thing anyway um that's 30 minutes shane you, you got anything else you need minutes. we that's are totally at um no i there was a bit there i was gonna say but it, it's completely lost on me now so i won't worry about it all right well that's Wrap all up. the time we have for this week everyone thank you for listening we'll be back next friday you can show find our show up at uh patch bay dot tv usually goes up in the evenings uh you can automatically get it downloaded to your phone or itunes or whatever if you want to uh with the rss feed on there or just listen to it right on the page if you want to do that okay that's it for us we'll see you guys next week good night